It is my honor to welcome you to the 19th annual Janet L. Norwood Award. It is a great honor to do this. Today, this is a webinar, regrettably because of the COVID pand pandemic, but I've already made a promise to my good friend, Leslie McClure, that we will make certain that when we are back to normal times, we will fly her down to visit with us and to celebrate this award in person. At this time, I uh, will turn the floor over or the webinar over to my good friend, Jeff Sikowski to proceed. Good morning, everyone. It is the honor of the graduate program director in the Department of Biostatistics to present the Charles R. Catholi Distinguished Dissertation Award. With this award, we recognize not only an accomplished graduate of our doctoral programs, but also an outstanding faculty member in Dr. Catholi. For those of you that know Dr. Catholi, uh, you already know the positive things I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. for, for our new students and invited guests, for many years, Dr. Catholi has dedicated himself to excellence in educating generations of biostatisticians. He joined the faculty at UAB in 1970, which is a tremendous accomplishment, and has uh, since seen many changes in the department. He's advised multiple students and faculty served as the department chair and was named Professor Emeritus in 2003. He has had a lasting impact on many people's lives he has encountered during his tenure here. Dr. Catholi has taught numerous courses in the department and is scheduled again to teach in the spring of 21. He has done so much more than simply teach classes though. He has advised everyone his dedication and accessibility to students extends far beyond the classroom and his dedication to the department has no end. So as soon as it is safe to do so, I encourage everyone to stop by and say hi and get to know him and take a class if you can. He always has great insight into professional and personal matters and it is truly an honor to be presenting an award that honors such a great mentor, educator and friend. So, um, Ordinarily, we'd have everyone stand up and applaud Dr. Catholi, but since that we can't really hear, we'll do that locally. Um, we'll proceed with the award to Dr. Justin Leach. So, Dr. Justin Leach is this year's recipient of the Charles R. Catholi Distinguished Dissertation Award. He defended his dissertation in August of 2020. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in uh, Mathematics with a minor in Religion from Birmingham Southern back in 2009. He joined the graduate programs in Biostatistics in 2014 to pursue a degree, a master's first of all, in Biostatistics. After excelling in the master's program, he joined the PhD program in 2016. While a student at UAB, Justin has served as a research assistant working with the REGARD study and as a teaching assistant teaching his own sections of BST 250. His research advisor is Dr. Chi Chi Aban, and his dissertation title is Incorporating Spatial Structure into Bayesian Variable Selection Using Spike and Slide Priors with Application to Imaging Data. So uh, at risk of, of being too brief, I'll just do a brief intro of, of what Justin's dissertation covered. So he examined the use of Bayesian linear models for the analysis of imaging data where traditional linear models are inadequate. So his dissertation did include the development of a software package in R for simulating imaging data, a simulation study evaluating the spike and slab lasso priors that incorporate the spatial structure and a direct evaluation of the method with the real data from the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. Following his dissertation defense, Justin became a postdoctoral scholar in the department where he's teaching uh, an honors version of the PUH 250 course and pursuing research with Dr. Aban. So please join me in congratulating Justin for his exemplary dissert doctoral dissertation work and all of his classmates who also did exceptional work on their dissertations this year. Congratulations, Justin. Before we go, I would like to say specifically to Justin. Justin, uh, I hope today that you can feel the pride, uh, the recognition of this faculty. We are very, very proud of what you have accomplished. Uh, we see great things in your future, sir. Keep
Keep doing what you're doing because you are excelling and you are a testimony to this department and we are honored by that. Um, it's my honor every year to talk about Janet L. Norwood. Um, if you say, oh, she was the first female head of the United States government's Bureau of Labor of Statistics, I do not mean to be disrespectful, but you dishonor her. You are completely underestimating this pioneering woman and scientist who embodied and treasured the principles of statistics and science. She was a champion, a champion beyond measure. She first championed the calls of data. She said, I believe that an objective scientifically created system is essential for a democracy to flourish. She served four United States presidents, two Democrats, two Republicans explaining some of the most complex statistical methods to the Joint Economic Committee 137 times before Congress, often in hostile situations, earning a reputation for being objective, methodical, unflappable, and delivering nothing but unspun facts. Her devotion to being true to the data was legendary to the point that when she was done, U.S. Representative David R. Obey made the comment publicly to her, you have proven yourself to be a most difficult witness to lead. She championed the statistical methods. She encouraged independent research among the Bureau employees while developing cognitive laboratories to bring methodologists together to revise and improve the methods to improve the consumer price index. When the National Longitudinal uh, Survey was on the chopping block to be no longer done, it would be taken out of all the budgets. She absorbed it into the cost of her budget to continue what she knew was essential decision impacting data. By her own admission, she avoided the word research at all cost. Instead, in her budgets, she would put in the term evaluation. Knowing evaluation was a political word that would trick Congress into believing that there might be cost savings that they could squirrel away. But she knew she was doing research and improving the methods. And by doing evaluation, improving all of these statistical methods. She was also very honest about the limitations of the statistical methods to the point that again, in a handwritten note to her, after she was done, uh, Congressman Stuart McKinney wrote the following words. In my 11 years in the House of Representatives, I have found it rare indeed to hear testimony from any witness who is not biased, filled with half truth, or simply silent with respect to discussion of faults within a program. Your testimony concerning the Consumer Price Index provided me with one of the only opportunities to receive worthwhile testimony while I was here. She championed collaboration, insisting, and I quote, it seems to me that we can vastly improve our statistical methods when we bring together expertise from many different fields. For example, psychology, linguistics, economics, and statistics. She signed a memorandum of understanding, the first of a collaborative network of statisticians across the federal government, including the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Census Bureau, and the National Center for Health Statistics. Finally, she championed her colleagues most of all. When Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, his Secretary of Labor, Ray Donovan, stated in a meeting, all communications from the Labor Department with the media will come through this information office. Knowing this would threaten the Bureau of Labor Statistics autonomy she politely said in a public meeting, 
But Secretary Donovan, if the press cannot speak to the, the Bureau of Labor Statistic members, the press will blame the president and accuse him of politicizing the interpretation of the data, even when he is innocent. The labor secretary responded, then the press, the press must speak to you and you alone. Instead of seeking the glory that would come with that position, she responded, Mr. Secretary, that will not work. Why don't you just say I take full responsibility for whatever any of my people say? They agreed. And as Norwood would say later, there was no risk there. I know my colleagues can be trusted to deal with all mat matters in a professional and objective manner. Every year we seek a female methodologist who reflects and carries forward these traits, championing the data, the methods, the collaboration, and the colleagues. And with that, I will now pass this to Charity Morgan to introduce our awardee. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the recipient of this year's Jenna L. Norwood Award, Dr. Leslie McClure. Dr. McClure comes to us from Drexel University's Dorsetide School of Public Health, where she is the chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, as well as the interim director of the Drexel Biostatistics Service Center. Dr. McClure received her MS in Preventative Medicine and Environmental Health from the University of Iowa and her PhD in Biostatistics from the University of Michigan. As many of you are aware, she, her first academic appointment was actually here at UAB in our Department of Biostatistics. She joined as assistant professor in 2004 and she rose to the ranks to become a full professor. While at UAB, she served as a director of graduate studies, as well as the head of the section on research methods and clinical trials. She was also honored as an Edge of Chaos Scholar. She left us to law start at Drexel University in 2015, and she's been missed ever since. Her research has led her to make many methodological advances related to clinical trials, including sample size reestimation, Utility, factorial design, and other applications. We're not the first to recognize Dr. McClure's achievements. She has been named a fellow of the American Statistical Association, the Society for Clinical Trials, and the American Heart Association. She is also an award-winning teacher, having received UA the UAB Dean's Excellence in Mentoring Award, UAB President's Award for Excellence in Teaching, and Drexel's Golden Apple Teaching Award. I especially want to highlight the fact that through her service, Dr. McClure has had a tremendous impact on our profession. She writes a very popular blog about life as academic statistician and has served as a great research resource for graduate students and junior faculty for several years. She was the organizer and session chair for the 2020 International Conference on Health Policy Statistics, using data to inform the ASA's policy on sexual misconduct. I can't put it any better than one of the, her nominators put in their letter saying that, quote, that her work has led to significant policy and cultural changes within the profession. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McClure. First of all, I want to congratulate Justin. So Justin came to UAB in 2014 and I left in 2015 and we overlapped. And in fact, we wrote a paper together uh, as co-authors and I'm really proud of him. And um, I think this is a great honor and I can think of no, uh, no other student to honor Dr. Catholi. I just want to take a minute and also mention Dr. Catholi. So Chuck has been a good friend and mentor to many of us, especially as junior people. And he's given us many pearls of wisdom throughout our times talking with him. And there's many lessons he's taught me, but I think that the one that he's taught me that I've carried with me that help, has helped me get where I am is don't let the bastards get you down. It's really, it's really true. Uh, I also want to thank the department very much for uh, this honor. It's, it's especially meaningful as, as Charity mentioned, I, I grew up at UAB and um, the folks who, who are talking today are my friends and my colleagues and it's, it's, the, it's very meaningful and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say too much more because I need to have my composure in order to give this talk. I also want to thank Kay for all of her help with the organizing of this this morning 
and um, again, thank the, the award committee and my nominators for, for nominating me. So today I'm gonna to talk not about my research, uh, but about some other information that's really important. So the, this is the 19th annual Janet Norwood Award. And my first one, oops, oh, and first I wanna talk about Dr. Norwood. So David mentioned several of her outstanding uh, accomplishments in uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and different methodological advances and mentioned also some of the other things that were important and I want to just comment on the, the, the traits that she had that I find particularly meaningful to me and that I strive to emulate. Uh, Dr. Norwood was committed to service and uh, to promoting her employees. And David mentioned a story where she uh, indicated that they could speak on, on behalf of the Bureau. And, and I, I strive to promote those around me in my daily work. And I, I believe that that's an important uh, aspect of being a leader. Um, she was dedicated to building relationships between government and academic communities. And I think in, it's important as a field that we have not only government and academic communities uh, working together, but also industry and nonprofits. And I just want to mention that even after retirement, that Dr. Norwood was committed to ad advancing women and that the Cosmos Club, which was a private social club for men and women distinguished in their profession that was established in 19 or excuse me, 1878. She was the first female president uh, only in, in 1995, only seven years after they began admitting women. So think about that for a second. That would be what, 1988 when women were admitted into this club. And then I wanna draw your attention to one of her quotes, which David also highlighted, and I think is especially uh, important now at, uh, as we think about the elections coming up and, and what's happening in our own world. I believe strongly that an objective scientifically created system of data is essential for a democracy to flourish. Okay, so here I am in the corner, or 2004, new faculty at UAB. You can see what happens when you can't get your hair cut for seven months, What going from that to here. Um, and my very first Norwood Award uh, was awarded to Alice Whittemore up in the left-hand corner of the screen. And Dr. David Allison presented this slide at the beginning. And I wanna thank Dr. Allison for sharing a couple slides with me that I'm, I'm sharing with you today, where he showed that the percentage of scientists in the labor force that are women in computer and mathematical sciences was actually going down since 1993. The next year he presented these data when uh, Claire Weinberg from the NIEHS was the recipient of the award. And this was 2005, and he showed these data where he showed that in math and statistics that um, across, across all sciences, really, the proportion that are women by career stage goes down as you get further along. And he commented that this is a cohort effect. That by the, and I was sitting in the audience and I was watching this thinking, oh, well, by the time I'm a full professor, this will look differently. 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, David presented the same data. And actually, I didn't know until he shared his slides with me that it was actually literally the same data from a publication in uh, 2002, I believe. But at, year after year, he shared this data. And he said, this is a cohort effect. This is a cohort effect. It's a cohort effect. But I, I started to get suspicious around that time as we didn't start to see more women in our field. So today, what I'm going to talk about is is this a cohort effect? And I'm gonna show you some data that supports this idea of the leaky pipeline. And then I'm gonna talk about why women are leaving STEM in general and statistics more specifically and some uh, advice about what we can do about it. Okay, so these are data from the National Science Foundation's National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. And this shows the percent female in math and stat among US citizens and permanent residents over time between 2008 2018. These data are publicly available. You can pull them up and look at all sorts of different fields. I had fun playing with them. My daughter is looking at engineering programs and I was looking at the different uh, engineering programs and we're not doing too poorly in bachelor's degrees in math and stat. About 45% of, of those go to women um, and that's pretty stable over time. But you can see what happens as we get more advanced in our degrees, the master's degrees, the doctoral degrees, the, the numbers get smaller. Uh, I should mention that this does not include biostatistics. 
But you can see that over time, we don't seem to be making any progress. And in fact, it appears, although I didn't do any statistical tests to see if it was significant, that, that the number of PhDs is trend, or the proportion of PhDs going to women is trending downward. These data come from the American Statistical Association um, th that are percent of biostatistics PhDs earned by females. So you can see a very different story here. The vertical, the horizontal line at 50% would be gender equity. And you can see that over time that uh, approximately 50% of PhDs in biostatistics are earned by women. And this is pretty constant over time. In fact, we had some time in 2010 and uh, 2012 where in fact more PhDs were, were being earned by women. So biostatistics is doing a little better in terms of PhDs. What happens after people graduate? Well, it turns out the data are really hard to find. Um, I, 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 been looking and looking and, and trying to get information about gender distribution is a little bit more difficult than I thought. So in 2018, uh, I was fortunate to lead the biostatistics chairs group and the, the leadership team decided we wanted to talk about uh, gender equity and retention in our departments. So we, we did our own survey. And among the 34 departments who reported data, you can see that overall 37% were female. So remember 50% of uh, PhDs are awarded to women. This was stable over time. Uh, you can see that in the assistant professor rank about 70, 39%, uh, excuse me, were female, a little better at the associate and then at the full professor rank about 30%. These are data from 2018. And there are of course some caveats. There are definitely more than 34 biostatistics departments. So we have some missing data. Also there, um, these are not broken down by, by track. So this includes research track, teaching tracks, tenure tracks, clinical tracks, um, which could dilute this a little bit because in fact, research has shown that more women are in um, non-tenure earning positions in academic institutions. So, so with those caveats, what we see in biostatistics is appears to be similar to what we see what we see in statistics and math. Although, albeit a little bit better, we're doing better, but we're still not doing great. So, over uh, many years, there's been a lot of data to suggest that there's a leak in the there's leaks in the pipeline for women PhDs in the sciences. And this work is from um, led by Marianne Mason, who is at the University of California, Berkeley. And she's been, she's been doing this work for many, many years. Uh, these data come from a variety of sources, but mainly from the University of California system. And what, what they found was that married mothers have a 35% lower odds than married fathers to get a tenure track position. And that married mothers had a 27% lower odds than married fathers with young children to become tenured. And that single women without children do almost the same as married fathers. And in fact, I first became aware of this work in 2008. She published a book with her daughter about, about this. It's called Mothers on the Fast Track. I remember sitting in my office in Nesbitt uh, having conversations with some of my colleagues about this book. And unfortunately, the data suggests that this hasn't changed since then. Just so we can uh, be clear, this is not just a US phenomenon. Uh, this is data from the UK that says, uh, science, a girl thing, not a woman thing yet. And it shows the proportion of women and men participating at different levels and qualifications between 2007 and 2009. So this top line here, that is the general certification of secondary education. So that's uh, that's secondary education there. And as this goes down in this figure, this last line is professor. So we're getting more uh, senior and you can see this huge disparity. Same thing is happening in Canada. This is the health safety and environment data. Uh, uh, and this is percentage of women at different uh, academic levels. And you can see in purple are the females and in Turquoise are the males, and, and in fact, at the bachelor's and master's level and, in, and earning PhDs, there's more females. And when we hit uh, assistant professors, these lines cross. And as we get more senior, again, the uh, proportion of women in the, in the profession goes down. 
And in my favorite figure, because clearly the Swiss have a better uh, grasp on how to present data in a clever way, um, you can see that the same trend is occurring. And these are data from the University of Basel from 2013. And you can see that master's graduates and PhD graduates, we are doing all right. And assistant professors already, there's a big hit in the proportion that are female. And when we get to full professors, it's even worse. And just, just to be complete, this is not just an academic problem. Uh, this is a figure based on a survey of 900 life or more than 900 uh, life sciences workers in Massachusetts. And you can see at the top of this figure that in 2015, women, earn, women earned 48% of medical school degrees, 55% of life science doctorates and 38% of medicinal chemistry doctorates. But in biotech, you can see that uh, women are entering at about the same rate as men, but only 20% of leadership positions and 10% of board seats are held by women. And in the figure, you can see where this breaking off point happen, begins to happen at the uh, mid-level leader level. And so while women are, are earning degrees at rates similar to men in STEM fields, there, there seems to be something happening uh, at the leadership level specifically in particular, but also at lower levels in academics as well. And so as statisticians, we know that there's um, correlation does not imply causality, but there's a lot of data that talk about different traditional measures of success as well. And so we can look at that to get a clue as to what, what might be um, happening. And I'll talk a little bit at the uh, end of these data about what might be informing what. So these data come from the NIH uh, data book. These are trends in awards between 1998 and 2019. And this shows the percentage of women who are receiving NIH funding by mechanism. And this kind of pale green line at the top is research career awards. So those are like K awards that are generally, but not always, awarded earlier in one's career. So, and then these others, uh, if you go down, this is other research awards. These are, um, oh, I, I lost what RPGs are, centers at the bottom here. And then, oh, these are R01 and, and related awards. And then these are um, other types of um, awards as well. And you can see what's happening here is that, again, the awards that go to early career typically tend to be uh, more equitably awarded. If you drill down a little bit to the R01 and equivalent grants, you can see that this um, the, the taller bars are the, the uh, number of awards among men, people identifying as men. The shorter, darker bars are the uh, number of awards to people identifying as women. And that red line represents the percentage to women. And you can see that um, the percent to women is slowly increasing, but, but still hovering around 30%. I think what's really also fascinating about this is you can also see the trend by looking at the, the uh, awards to men, the trend in NIH funding just in general. Um, but again, we know that there are fewer women in, in careers where they might be pursuing awards. So this perhaps could be reflecting not that there's a bias in who receives them, but rather that there are fewer women applying for them. So we have to be careful in how we interpret these data. There's some good news. Uh, and I know that if you keep up with the, the uh, NIH directors newsletters, you might have read about this. These are the R01 equivalent success rates. So this is given that you apply for a, an award, what are your success rates? And you can see that um, at the bottom, these two lines, the, the light blue and the dark blue here, represent new R01s among men and women. You can see that since 1998, these are essentially overlapping. So men and women have equal success rate, equivalent success rates for R01s for new applications. The two lines above that show renewals. And so you can see also, just, just a note, you can see that you're much more likely to get a renewal once you've had an R01, right? Um, and you can see that men are more likely to get renewals than women, although not dramatically so. So there is some good news that if you do submit grants, that uh, men and women are about equally likely to be successful. 
Other metrics that we think of as indicating success in academic circles include um, publications. And so this work represents, this figure represents the gender composition of authors from the JSTOR network. So this is just one network of publications, one group of, one publisher that encompasses many different um, fields. And these are data beginning from 1900 to 2011. And so, you know, because everything is virtual and online now, you can sort of grab a lot of data. And this comes from um, a PLOS One publication that, um, from a group that's done a series of, of things looking at um, gender composition for publication. And actually they have a really cool um, interactive web browser that you can sort of drill down to specific fields and to look at the publications by, by gender. Um, so what you see in this is the gray bars represent male authorship and the white bars represent female authorship. The black line represents the fraction of all of the authors that are female. So those gray bars, white bars, and black line look at all of the authors. The red line is the fraction of authors um, that first authors that are female. And so we see that over time, it's relatively low, but going up in more recent years. And then the blue line represents the fraction of last authorships that are female, which I think is a sort of interesting metric because um, the conventions are different across fields. And so in many fields, especially lab fields, last authorship senior represents senior authorship. So often that's the person who is leading the lab or who gets the funding, but that's not always the case. So it's a little harder for me to interpret what's happening with the blue line. Uh, but the, the red line, although it's still low, it's still 30% of uh, first authors are female, it's, it's improving. And again, we have to take this in the context of what we just saw about uh, women in the, in the fields and what proportion are staying in STEM fields. Okay, so this next, this next um, figure represents, it's the same data, but now only looking from 1950 to 2011. And this blue line represents the ratio of men's to women's self-citations per, per authorship. And what's telling us is that on average, men cite themselves more frequently than women do. And um, this is this is this becomes important because of some of the metrics we use for promotion, right? So if we're using um, indices that that factor into the the number citations, and and men tend to cite themselves more frequently, then their more their index will be higher. And so this is an important metric, although kind of a, a funny one in some ways. Okay, another metric that people use for judging promotion is editorial board membership. And so these data come from um, a group that looked at representation on journal editorial boards in the mathematical sciences. So this encompasses all of the statistical and biostatistical journals that we would uh, look at, but it also encompasses all of the math journals. So the figure on the left looks at the proportion of journal editorships that are held by women and uh, the figure on uh, and the figure on the right looks at the gender breakdown for journals with the highest representation of women. So what, what what's striking to me is on the left, uh, and this is among 435 journals. Sorry, that 61 journals had zero edit editorships held by women, and you can see that this graph only goes up to 0.4. So we're not we're not getting uh, close to gender parity. And you can see that um, the one that did the best was the annual reviews of statistics in its application. And as you go across here, you can see that many of these are st uh, statistical or mathematical journals that are a little more applied. And I want to just mention that because this is a continuing theme. And when I show you the data just from the statistical journals, you can see similar trends. Um, something else, just as a note, that if you're interested, how um, how these authors classify gender, the algorithms are really fascinating. And this one being a math group used a really, really fascinating algorithm. So if you're interested, you should check that out. 
Okay, so this is data from 2016 from the ASA. This comes from the AMSTAT News. So now we're looking in our field. This is um, only among ASA members and they again looked at 400, uh, that, that actually might have been, this was looking only at ASA and top statistical journals. So what they found, uh, so first of all, I should mention at the time, 35% uh, of the membership of ASA is female. And so this is looking at the percent of women who are um, on editorial boards for among ASA members. So what you see is that they're, we're doing fairly well for some of them, the Journal of Educational Behavioral Statistics, 43%, 38% um, for the Journal of Agricultural, Biological and Environmental Statistics. But there are some are doing pretty poorly. And if you look at the Journal of Business and Economic Statistics, um, technometrics. Um, and then you can look on the far right column, any women presently in a primary editor role, and we have a few. Okay, at the bottom are the non-ASA journals where you can see um, Annals of Applied Statistics has about 28% females, and JRSSB, the methodology one, is about 21%. So not bad uh, relative to some of the other statistical journals. So I want to re, re, point out again that this is among ASA members. Um, in 2019, this was updated by Andrea Folks, uh, looking at the top 12 stat and biostat journals. And so in this figure here, this dark solid line represents 50% board members for the editorial board. Uh, this dotted line here represents the median among these 12 journals, which is about 22%. And you can see how the different journals uh, a bop around across that, that median. And you can see in, in the more recent data that um, the applied journals, again, tend to do a little bit better than the methodological journals. Not clear what that means or why that is. Um, we can always speculate, but um, it's not clear. Okay. So what about ASA fellows? So this is data, again, from the ASA uh, taken from a recent um, Amstat News article as well. And what we see, so this first figure represents the percent of nominations that were women. And again, this, um, this th doesn't track too much, too far from um, the percent of ASA members that are women. And in fact, when you look at the age breakdown of the ASA members, um, this tracks pretty, pretty well with the ASA membership. And so while, while we want to see better numbers, we want to see more women being nominated, uh, we're not doing too poorly relative to the ASA membership. Um, further, this bottom figure shows the percent of success among nominations. And what we see is that in some, in some years, women fared a little better. And so we're not seeing a big bias in the success. Once you get nominated, men and women are essentially equal, equally likely to, to be successful. And one other piece of information that I thought was interesting is that women were on average older when nominated. And this is, this is um, in the article, they speculate uh, that this is perhaps a function of the fact that women are less likely to, one, ask to be nominated, and two, are more likely to wait longer to be nominated. And this is, this is consistent with data about promotion, that women are less likely to ask to be promoted to full professor, and that they're more likely to wait longer to seek uh, full professorship. Okay, and finally, the ASA awards data. So this is a, a variety of different types of um, recognition that the American Statistical Association gives. These data are aggregated, so I wasn't privy to uh, raw data, but these data are aggregated from 1996 to 2005 and 2006 to 2015. And I think the, the column I wanna draw your attention to is the percent women uh, for each keeping in mind that they're some of them are especially are relatively small uh, numbers. So, so with that caveat that we have small sample sizes. And what we see is that um, we're not doing so well on many of the awards and that the percent women has not really improving even as the percent women in the ASA and uh, increases and as the age of women 
in the ASA, the distribution starts to shift. So that cohort effect that David Allison talked about for all those years um, maybe isn't happening. And I just wanna mention the awards where we seem to see the most women are the Education Award, the Founders Award, which is given for distinguished service to the organization. And interestingly, the Nother Award uh, for junior people, which is an award given for non-parametric statistics. But we don't see the same trend among the senior folks for the Nother Award. So there's some interesting data, again, with the caveat that there's some small sample sizes. But it's interesting data that shows that, um, that in fact, women are, are, are being recognized a little bit less frequently than men. But, but as we know, as statisticians, it, we don't know the direction of causality here. We don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. We don't know if women are leaving STEM because they're behind in the metrics or if women are behind in the metrics because they're leaving the field. And so, and, and I mentioned there's a lot of data out there. There are a lot of data that talk about that women are leaving STEM. If you Google women leaky pipeline STEM, there's a ton of data, much of it is field specific. However, when you try to find out why women are leaving, there isn't a lot of data. There's not, there's a lot of anecdotal uh, stories about why people left, but it's all individual and it, it's very, very infrequently aggregated. And it's really difficult to, to try to tease out whether people are leaving because they're not being as successful. Uh, maybe they're not getting promoted as frequently as men or they're not getting um, awards or they're not getting published and so they're leaving, or if they're not getting promoted because they're leaving. So, so those data are really hard to find. I will say I did find one, uh, one study that is from Australia in 2015 that asked uh, what, what, what factors impacted your decision to leave STEM or what's impeding your career progress. And the top two were balancing work and life responsibilities and workplace culture. And so both of these are, are very difficult um, problems to tackle, right? Their work-life uh, balance and, and, and how you do that is different for everyone. And workplace culture is really difficult to change. And in fact, uh, my dean has a great saying that I love to, to repeat that you think it's hard to change history, try changing a history department. And it's really true that academic culture in particular is really slow to change and, and, and perhaps because the reward system uh, doesn't necessarily reward making those changes. The next uh, highest reason that's not far behind is lack of access to senior roles for women and then lack of women in senior roles and lack of job opportunities. And so what we see the next set of, um, and then beyond that, uh, lack of role models and lack of career support. So the next set of reasons that these women cited for impeding their career progress are all related to sort of that job situation and um, whether they're, they're able to find opportunities and whether they're getting support and having role models to, to help move them into those opportunities. And then after that is discrimination. And I think that's really interesting too, um, particularly as someone who spent the last three years working on the ASA task force about, um, in sexual misconduct to try to help change policy in the ASA, um, that, that, that sort of ranks relatively low because there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that people are leaving uh, STEM careers because of discrimination and harassment. Okay, so let's look at some other data that I was able to find. Okay, so this next figure shows the impact of child rearing on STEM careers. This is among 532 people who were surveyed and this is looking at new parents. And these are all people who had babies in the same cohort. So their babies were all born around the same time. And you can see uh, the upper panel is men and the lower panel is women. And the blue, the darkest blue bar represents staying in STEM full-time. The lighter blue bar is uh, part-time in STEM. The little green that doesn't show up a lot for men, but this, this lighter green or the intermediate green is part-time non-STEM. 
The darker green is full-time non-STEM, and this last uh, piece here, this lightest green, has left the workforce entirely. So what we're seeing, uh, first of all, if you compare year to year, we see that women uh, are staying in STEM at lower rates. But what's encouraging to me is that the leaving the workforce entirely looks like it could be um, it could be getting smaller in 2010 for women. And the number of men who are taking, um, who are making changes to their career after the birth of a child is increasing. And so um, I think there is some, some again, some reason to, to feel hopeful that perhaps things are changing, albeit slowly. Okay, so I mentioned that it's really hard to find data about um, about workplace culture and climate, but there is a lot of data about discrimination and how people perceive their experiences at work. And this is from the Pew Research Center. It's women and men in STEM. And this is the percent of those who say they've experienced the following at work because of their gender. And you can see that overall, 19% of men in STEM jobs and 50% of women say that they've experienced any of these types of gender-related discrimination. And now I'm not talking about harassment or misconduct here, but discrimination. And so you can see uh, earning less than a, someone of, the other, uh, other gen of another gender doing the same job, um, treated as if you were incompetent, uh, experiencing repeated small slights at work, uh, receiving less support from senior leaders, and then the ones that aren't quite as disparate, but feeling isolated in the workplace, being passed over for important assignments, um, and then even less so being turned down for a job and being denied a promotion. And so again, some of these, um, these discrimination situations are much more um, culture related, I think. Okay, and so drilling down a little further, these are data from the same Pew uh, Research Center report. This is looking at sexual harassment. And um, the first part of the panel, this is the percent of employed adults who say that they have ever experienced sexual harassment at work. And it's 7% among men in STEM jobs, 22% among women in STEM jobs, and 22% among women in non-STEM jobs. So perhaps it's maybe no different in the workplace um, among women in STEM. I should have mentioned these are data that come from several sources. It's the 1990 and 2000 census, the 2014 to 2016 American Community Survey, and a nationally representative sample of uh, almost 5,000 US adults, and they're from 2017. So, so there's a variety of sources. Um, and you can see that even among men who perhaps haven't experienced sexual harassment, they do believe that, that sexual harassment is a problem in their workplace and even more so in their industry. And so I think I would be remiss if I didn't talk about sexual misconduct uh, experienced by ASA members. And so these are data that come from the survey that many of you may have participated in a couple of years ago that uh, arose through um, the, the, the task force that I led, and I, I, I misspoke, it wasn't a survey, it was a questionnaire. And you can see that um, across the, almost across the board, so in this, uh, in this figure, males are represented in orange, females are represented in blue, and overall, that's the average-ish, is represented in red. And you can see that um, ubiquitously for all of these different types of misconduct, uh, women have experienced, people identifying as female have experienced this more frequently than men, uh, those identifying as men. And in some cases, it's much, much more frequent. Um, and, and again, these are the sorts of things that I showed from the Pew data where gender-based disrespect and, uh, uh, and, and someone being condescending, uh, and just differential treatment, but also inappropriate conversation, unwelcoming jokes and comments and teasing and um, derogatory, derogatory terms about your gender. Um, if you haven't looked at this, this document with the results from this questionnaire, uh, I would encourage folks to do so. Uh, what's, most, what's most poignant is the not necessarily the qu quantitative data, uh, 
but the qualitative data, the comments at the end where people discuss the situations they've been in or people discuss their impression of this in our, in our field of statistics. Okay, so what can we do? What can we do to make this better? So I wanna just return to the idea that we don't know that people are leaving because of these, um, we don't have any long-term data that follows folks that, that asks these questions. So we can only show that there's correlations, that women are leaving uh, the field, but also that these, these situations are happening. So what can we do? First of all, we are all responsible. This isn't a woman issue, this is a person issue. And I, I wanted to, um, to mention this quote by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, women will have achieved true equity when men share with them the responsibility of bringing up the next generation. And this doesn't just refer to child rearing, but this means bringing up the next generation. I was really fortunate when I was at UAB, I had outstanding mentors who were men, who were women. I was fortunate to have people take re help take responsibility for my own success, um, help me take responsibility for my own success. But we all have to be responsible. We all have to think about ways that we can ensure that we're doing better by the next generation. Um, I, I, just to share some anecdotes, I remember um, one person at one point said to me um, that maybe I wanted to be a little more careful about what I said during faculty meetings when I was a really early young assistant professor. And I was lucky to have support from the department, from other folks in the department who said, you know, we didn't hire you to sit and, and not voice your opinion. And um, it's often women and other folks who come from um, underrepresented areas in our field that get that are to whom it's implied that perhaps they shouldn't speak so loudly. And in, instead we should be encouraging our colleagues to speak up and, and share their input because we know that we all do better when we have more diverse opinions. All right, so one thing we can do is enact more family-friendly policies. So I wanna give a shout out to many UAB folks who were involved in this paper, uh, both current and former led by Michelle Cardell, who uh, was at UAB, Emily Durander, um, I believe Karen, um, Bertha, of course, still there, breaking, breaking glass ceilings on her own, Dory, uh, Amanda Willig and others, uh, which I was fortunate to be involved with that um, spelled out a roadmap for equity in academia. And so it's a, this paper talks a lot about the investment that we make in, in training faculty uh, of all genders, uh, but then we lose important people or we lose important investments when people leave academia. And so this, this spells out different things we can do. And it's been shown that having more family friendly policies in place is actually, actually benefits all faculty. And so some of these things are um, thinking about how we recruit, how do we recruit? So what can we do to be more equitable in recruitment? Um, it's been shown that there, if there are two or more women in a candidate pool, that can increase the odds of hiring a woman by 79%, okay? Um, paid leave policies, it's a huge issue in the United States as a whole. I remember when, when my son was born, when Preston was born, he went, I, I took eight weeks off and that was it. And I was fortunate that UAB had great daycare that was really close to my office and I could visit him uh, during the day when I needed to, but, but it was, um, and it was, it was wrong in retrospect, I'm embarrassed that I did it. I set a terrible example for uh, others around me uh, when that was, because I didn't take a break in my tenure clock and I should have, I should have set that example that this is what's expected and, and what's normal. Um, and access to quality childcare. And so, um, again, I was really fortunate when my daughter was born, my husband and I were graduate students at the University of Michigan and they had a childcare subsidy. And um, we were really fortunate to be able to use that to help pay for, for daycare. And UAB's daycare center was great, but it was incredibly small. And so creating more options for for uh, quality childcare. And again, this isn't just an issue for women. I remember when I was on the commission for the status of women in the university at UAB and people would bring up childcare as a women's issue, but it's really a family issue. And we need to make sure that we're developing these equity, equitable policies that will help everyone. 
Um, I'm not going to go through all nine of these, but some other um, important ones that I want to mention are evaluation bias. So there's a lot of literature suggesting that uh, that women are judged more harshly in their course evaluations than men. And as department chair, I get to read all of the course evaluations for the faculty in my department. And I often see things like, Dr. So-and-so should get a belt or she needs new whatever, talking about her appearance. But I never see that in the course evaluations for men. And so when we, but when we evaluate faculty, course evaluations are the primary way we evaluate teaching. Um, further, there's a lot of evidence that service loads are, um, are disproportionately uh, pro, um, higher for women and for, and further for people of color. And so thinking about how we assign service or how we value service, there's, uh, it's not necessarily always failures of leadership, but perhaps there's uh, people who enjoy service more. And so maybe we need to pay closer attention to how we're rewarding that. Um, and then finally, having quality faculty mentors. And again, I mentioned that this doesn't have to necessarily be necessarily mean female mentors. When I came to UAB, there were no female full professors in the department. And if I wanted a female mentor, um, I was really hard pressed to find one in our department. And in fact, I believe that um, there was only one associate professor who came in at the same time as I did at that time. So, so I think that we need to think about how we can help people find mentors if we can't provide them in our own homes. Um, and again, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that they all have to be female mentors, but we need mentors who can advocate for us and who can sponsor us. We need mentors um, who can help promote our own careers, particularly for women who, who tend to have uh, a harder time promoting their own careers. Okay, and so what are ways we can increase those access to mentors? Um, so certainly if you have them in your own institution, making connections for young women is really important. And again, that doesn't necessarily have to be women in your department. And I often encourage the faculty in my department to look for mentors outside of our department too, because sometimes it's nice to have a mentor who isn't ingrained in all the politics and all of the day-to-day -day decision making. Um, Further, there are mentoring programs for um, women, for people from underrepresented fields, for men in, 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 epidemia, in the epidemiology section. Um, there's for everyone. I mean, there, there are mentoring programs for everyone is what I'm trying to say in, in different places. And so the ASA, many of the sections uh, have mentoring programs. And so encouraging young folks uh, to get involved with those and also encouraging our more senior folks to serve as mentors. And it's a great, uh, a great way to create more mentoring uh, opportunities. And then finally, we have to have no tolerance for harassment. And this is, this is something that I've sort of taken as, as my calling, I guess, over the last three years. And, and, and I feel very strongly about um, I think that we need to think, rethink how we view harassment in the sciences. Um, there's been a call to, to count uh, sexual misconduct as scientific misconduct and handle it in the same way. If, if someone's falsifying their data, then we have certain mechanisms for dealing with that. But we don't necessarily have those mechanisms if somebody's mistreated uh, a junior colleague or a student. Um, we have very difficult power structures in academia that makes it difficult for young young folks to uh, report or to to um, or, or to react without fear of re retaliation and I, and this might be one of the reasons anecdotally this has been suggested as one of the reasons that so many women leave STEM fields. Um, what, college campuses are traditionally terrible about managing complaints of sexual misconduct. Uh, traditionally, what has happened is that the, the university will come to an agreement with the harasser that they will not, they will seal the record if the person leaves. And so someone's able to leave and get a position elsewhere and 
Um, there's sort of no um, no ramifications for their actions, and they can continue in many cases to harass or abuse young folks or other folks. Um, some funding agencies are starting to to view this differently. The Welcome Trust has indicated that they will pull grants from known harassers. Um, this figure on the right comes from the NIH. They are working hard to try to implement a policy that um, that that puts sexual harassment on the same level as research misconduct and grant fraud um, and, and other types of misconduct and has a policy about this now as well. Um, I think that um, I think that it's really important that we think holistically about all of the different reasons we might be, be losing well-qualified, uh, well-trained women to uh, in STEM fields and in statistics in particular. I think that there's not one thing we can do to make it better, but rather that there's a lot of things we need to all do to make it better. I wanna end by returning to Janet Norwood and a quote that she had that said, I think the person who influenced me most was my husband, who has always encouraged me to strive for more and to do more. He has all, really always been supportive. I think that for a married woman to have a career, she needs to have a husband who is very secure and not competitive with her. And for years, people have asked me how I've managed to do all the different things I do. And I've always said that I've been really fortunate to have a really supportive husband who, who a really supportive partner who takes an active role in our household and in our family. And I think if Janet Norwood were, were alive today and if she were stating this again, she would be a little more inclusive and talk about having a partner who, who supports her. And I think it's really important that we think about the things we can do to create policies that impact not just women, but families that impact women uh, that don't have children, that impact people of color or other folks that are traditionally underrepresented in our fields, and we do what we can to support them as well. I just wanna end where I began by thanking the department for, for honoring me in this way. Um, what, what, why I'm here today is really not a reflection of me, but also a reflection of all of you. And you know, over the years, I've often referred to my Birmingham family, and um, I still do. And I just, uh, I, I know that I wouldn't be where I am without the supportive department at UAB. And I hope that I pass this along to our next generation. And that one day that there's a woman receiving the Janet Norwood Award who can talk about how we have such great gender equity and how far we've come and, um, well, thank you again, and I'm happy to take any questions. As a male student, junior research, how could I help to create a welcoming, friendly, and comfortable environment for females? What are the things that I can start to act something besides stop men-splaining? Thank you for asking that. So certainly there are things we can all do, right? And one is to listen and listen to your colleagues and your friends and, and to ask questions, ask them. I mean, I mentioned that each of us is different and each of us needs different things to be supported, to feel supported. And so um, ask your colleagues, ask your friends what, what they need um, and listen when they answer. But remember that sometimes it's, it's hard, right, to say, I need help. We all, we all have a difficult time asking for help. Um, and remember that um, if you're questioning whether you should be doing something, then you should ask someone, okay? Um, I, I, I mean, I think in, in general, most of us have the best of intentions. And so, so it's really important that you rem you, we lead with that, that, that it's really important that we remember that we, we all want each other to be successful. So, um, so, so I think that having good intentions is a great place to start, but, but asking questions and listening are really important as well. I mean, I think back to when I was a junior faculty member at UAB, and I'm looking at Jeff and David and thinking about my colleagues back then and um, you know, they were really supportive. They really listened to me. And, and you know, I remember the day that 
Um, David, I hope this isn't too personal, but that David's wife went back to work full time. A few days later, he walked into my office and he said, I really understand you a lot better now. That, that I didn't really understand what your life was like before. And having, you know, honest and open conversations with folks and listening to them and, and really hearing them is really important. And I think it's difficult because we're, we're, um, we're, what's the word I'm trying to think of? We're acculturated in academia to separate our family from our work and not to talk about our family when we're at work and uh, not to have a job when we're in social settings, right? And it's particularly true for women. And so, you know, part of that is we need more leaders who are willing to talk about their families, men and women. We need more leaders who are willing to share their struggles and share their challenges as well as their successes. As a chair of EPI and Biostat, how would you see Biostat, EPI, and potentially data science could facilitate, motivate, assist each other rather than creating ill-intentioned competition and trolling online? That is a, another whole talk for another whole time, but I'm happy to take a stab at it. Um, well, one of the things, so one of the things I learned at UAB was the spirit of collaboration. And I was, you know, when I talk about my story, when I talk with young folks about how I got to where I am, um, a lot of times I hear surprised that, that I found a place that was so open to promoting and supporting collaborative statisticians. And uh, I'm so thankful I found UAB because it did promote and support collaborative statisticians and um, still does. And, but it made me feel much more centered in my career. And, you know, I, I, when I talk about things like imposter syndrome, I talk about my, my big fear of being found out that I don't know how to do statistical methods, which isn't true, right? But um, I'm, I'm much more comfortable in the collaborative wor world. And I think that helped me um, feel more comfortable leading a joint department. And I think that uh, because it's a joint department, the folks in my, in my school tend to understand the necessity of having strong collaborators when you're developing methods, but the EPI folks tend to understand the benefit of having methodologists when you're doing when they're doing their research. So it's very mutually beneficial. And I think that um, we have to stop seeing it as competition, that we all have a sa the same goal of improving the health of the public. And if we work together, we can do it much more effectively and efficiently than if we work separately. And this is true, you know, I know there's a lot of trolling online that's been happening um, in Twitter with econ versus epidemiology um, and with the advent or, or the, the, the popularity of machine learning methods. There's a lot of um, discussions in, in, in social media and, and some of it's not so nice, but we can all learn from each other, right? So I think that we teach our students about biases and we teach our students about validity and we teach our students about reproducibility. And we, we talk about how you, who you can make inference to when you're doing a study, right? And we know that we cannot make inference to a different sample than our different population than our sample comes from. And we, we have colleagues that are computer scientists who are using machine learning algorithms. They're fantastic programmers and they have a great understanding of what their algorithm is doing, they don't really understand the data collection aspects of it and the data they're using. And so we can make, we can develop great partnerships where we can learn from them in terms of the algorithmic aspects of it. And we can, and they can learn from us in terms of, of the, um, the validity and the bias that goes into it. And, you know, we see this all the time with new machine learning algorithms or facial recognition that does a great job identifying white males because they're trained on data that comes from white males. And so thinking about those biases and those limitations is something we're really well trained at. And so these are opportunities for partnerships rather than competition. Given how difficult it was to get data on gender and career advancement in academics, do you think we need to push for publicly available data on this? Would this help move academics in the right direction? Yes, yes, and yes, absolutely. So um, 
I'll give you an example and something I neglected to mention was the impact of COVID on young parents in particular, but on all of us and how that's uh, impacting career productivity. And one example of this is at Drexel, they had an opt-in policy for a tenure clock extension for, um, for COVID related and other race relation related um, happenings this, this spring. And they sent out some information and then eventually they told us 24 people opted in. And that was it. We don't know how many people, uh, how many assistant professors there are in the tenure track who this option was available to. We don't know anything about those 24 people. And so I'm, 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 uh, I know the, the associate provost for faculty affairs fairly well. So I emailed her and I said, I think this is an amazing opportunity to collect some data. So would you be willing to work with me? And we, I bet we could write a fantastic paper looking at who opted in and who didn't. And then I think we could write a grant looking uh, at, at our cohort of assistant professors over time. And we could collect some data from them. We could do this annually and look at their trajectories. Crickets. No response. I've resent it a couple of times. Universities, I think, are frightened. They're afraid to put that information out there. Um, and I think that, you know, as, as a statistician, I believe that the more data we have, the better we can learn, right? And so um, I, I, I think that universities are afraid to put this information out there. Um, and I think... I don't know how we move that needle. I don't know how we get information uh, about these sorts of things. And I can tell you uh, again, another sort of not to, to bash Drexel, but also another instance at Drexel that's happening right now, I'm involved with an NSF advance grant. So that's a, um, a, a grant mechanism that NSF has to advance the opportunities for women in STEM fields. And uh, we are trying to get data from, from the university about promotion not just promotion and tenure, but also promotion from associate to full professor. Um, I've done some research about the mid-career transition, and it turns out that that's actually the most stressful and most difficult time in an academic career. And we're focusing on the mid-career transition, and there's there's almost no data available. And one of the one of the um, one of the aspects of the advance grant is, is looking at intersectionality. And so we've been trying not only to get gender distribution, but by race ethnicity. And that's even harder yet than getting data on gender. So again, I, I don't know, I don't know if it's because it's difficult to assess some of these aspects that we're trying to understand, or if universities, just the bureaucracy is so big that it makes it difficult. Um, or if it simply just hasn't been a priority. But I definitely think that this is a, a way forward. I think we can't really understand why we're seeing this, this leaky pipeline, why people are dropping out of our fields without having access to real data about it. Are more data being collected related to other categories of sex identification besides just men and women? Yeah, I think for gender identity, there certainly is becoming um, more more data being collected. And I, I try to be careful to talk about people who identify as women versus people who identify as men. Um, and but the, the the fact of the matter is, right now, that's all we have data for. Um, I know that in the systems that we use at Drexel, that they have expanded those to allow students to identify in other ways and faculty as well when you register as a new faculty member. So, so there is some progress being made there. I suspect it will be slow and that um, also, so I will say, and if anyone's interested, I think I have these slides attached at the end, but we also did collect race ethnicity data among biostat faculty, um, but it gets really difficult as well because you're getting to situations where you can identify people. And so, you know, again, we think about when we use census data and when they won't give us the data because it can identify someone. When we start talking about a trans man in epidemiology who might be black, um, there may only be one or two in the country. And so we have to be really careful when we're doing this. And in fact, when I looked at the, 
survey data for by race, ethnicity, and gender among biostat departments, I was like, oh, here's Scarlett, here's Lonnie. I could I could identify the, the faculty from my department. So, so we have to be really careful. Um, but yes, I think that institutions are starting to collect more data um, about other gender identities. If there's an institutional level reluctance to focus on improvement of underrepresented groups, how much do you think can be driven by individual universities, or is it going to require substantially more buy-in by funding agencies and journal publishers as the drivers of academic currency? It's a really, really great question. So, so I, I have two answers. The second, the, the first answer is I think that universities will only change when funding agencies and publishers tell them they have to, particularly funding agencies, that if funding agencies start to say, if your institution you know, doesn't have X or Y, then we're not gonna give you grants. Or if we find you're not reporting sexual misconduct to our agency, then we're gonna cut you off. Then I think institutions will change those things. But I really think the real change is gonna come from all of us. That if we demand, if all of us start to demand that our universities do things differently, then change will happen, right? If we say, I'm not serving on that search committee if I'm the only woman on it, or I'm not serving on a search committee if there are no people from underrepresented groups on the search committee, um, then um, that will change. Or if promotion committees start to look at promotion differently. So I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago about team science to a group of fellows and residents at the children's hospital, the local children's hospital. And um, team science, you know, has been around for a long time. Many of us participate in team science. And I know that our leaders had to fight at different times to get us promoted, right? Even though NIH says we want multi-PI grants, we want to see more team science. And the, when you looked at those publication uh, figures, you can see that the number of authors on papers on average is going up, right? We see more team science happening, yet our metrics for evaluating promotion are based on individual achievements, being the PI on your own grant, being first author, being senior author. So we as faculty, as academics, and as leaders in our field need to demand that that will change. We need to be in the room and say that that's not okay, that this is not what science is about anymore. Otherwise, we're not gonna have, we're not gonna see change happen. I really think it's contingent on all of us to speak up and speak out. And, you know, I think it's hard and it's especially, I get asked, I get this, question a lot, like, when did you learn to speak up? And I think I was fortunate. Um, and as I look at these pictures that are on the slide, I look at all the people who supported me when I spoke up. And I was I was fortunate to be in a department in an environment where people didn't tell me you're an assistant professor, you don't have the ability to give an opinion. And to be perfectly honest, if people had really continually told me that I wouldn't have stayed, right? Because those of you who know me know that I'm, I'm not one to hold my tongue. So I needed to be in an environment that was supportive of who I was. And further, I am a very collaborative statistician and I needed to be in an environment that was supportive of that. And I think that we as, as academics and as, as leaders need to create, help create environments that support people to be successful. And success looks different for each of us. You know, I mean, some of us teach really well and, um, and that's important for an academic community, right? I mean, we are an academic institutions because of our students. And so we need to stop devaluing teaching and value that more. And again, it takes leaders who are willing to speak up and say, teaching is important. And I know you have leadership that does that now. Um, but we also need to view service as important. We need to speak up and say, look at the amazing service this person has done and maybe we should recognize that doing service takes away time from doing other things. And we need to support that if people are doing good service. Um, so, so I think it's, again, I think that there's gotta be external pressure on institutions, but I also think that it's, it's not gonna be the college presidents, the university presidents who all of a sudden say we're changing. It's gotta be all of us that demand change. So, so while we're waiting, I wanna just go back to, um, you know, my, my 
first couple of slides where, where David Allison said over and over, this is a cohort effect and this is an age effect and in time, you know, and here we are 17 years later and we're still doing no better than we were before. And I, again, I think it's all of our responsibility to make sure that we do better. If we have no other questions, I would like to one more time um, tell my very good friend, Leslie McClure, congratulations on this honor. Uh, I will, on behalf of the Dean, I don't know if he's had to step off or not, but uh, Dr. Irwin put in the uh, questions and answers. Congratulations on this award, Dr. McClure. Wonderful lecture this morning and many layers of importance regards. We do greatly appreciate it, Leslie, and you have my word and my promise that as soon as we can have you down here, we will celebrate this great, great accomplishment. Thank you, David. And I'll just say that I've been craving saws. So as soon as <laughs> I can get there, I will be there. Okay, we will make it happen. Great. Thanks and, again. And with that, I am going to close this, this ceremony, but then again, one more time. I just want to say congratulations.